not all at once, a long time. So we're going to dip into an artistic project now that I did a couple of years ago. <coughs> I've spoken, pardon me, I've spoken about this in past lasers, so if any of you have um, been to that and there's some crossover, I apologize for any repetition, but uh, it's a project that absorbed a few years of my life and had so many facets to it that um, I could keep talking about it in future lasers, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, it was called Macrocosma Bali. Um, it was, uh, it combined uh, music for an entire gamelan orchestra, that is a, a, a group of about 25 musicians, with um, a large scale multimedia presentation. And uh, it was presented at the Asian Art Museum. The Asian Art Museum, okay, well, that's what happens when you put together things rapidly. Um, the Asian Art Museum in May of 2011, and uh, involved, um, I was the artistic director, uh, Made Arnawa, which is the gentleman in the far right lower corner, was my uh, collaborative, my main collaborator, he's, and he's the music director of the, the group that came to perform the piece, which is called Sikil Gong Trunamakar, and it's from the village of Tunja. And then there was a whole San Francisco-based production design team that included these individuals, and among them, I'm happy that Ian is right here with us in the orange-colored pullover here. Um, we're gonna touch very much on uh, some of his work, which was integral to the piece. So the theme here is kind of technology, especially uh, small-scale portable technology, and how it impacted a work that was looking at something very old, you know, looking at aspects of Balinese culture and philosophy that go back centuries. Um, we're just going to focus on one aspect of this piece. It ended up being about a 70-minute work, uh, and we're going to we're going to talk to excerpt what's called here excerpt one, um, which was a reading from an ancient text. First of all, here are the musicians again. This is now on the right. Uh, this was the, when I got to Bali a few months uh, before the project happened, in order to you know put together the last the final elements. Um, I happened to arrive on a, on a very auspicious day in the Balinese calendar, and so on the very day I arrived, they were doing this procession that required musical accompaniment, so I went along with them and snapped a bunch of photos. Here they are playing cymbals. Um, oh, actually, I'll go back. You can see people walking in the background, traversing the rice field, headed to a temple, that was, which was a, to accompany them. Here we are sitting on the road, hanging out in between uh, playings. Uh, that same day, when they were done with that uh, ceremony, uh, we went to someone's home because it was an auspicious day on the calendar. And we also did uh, accompany the ceremony there. Uh, this was a rehearsal. We started, uh, we worked on the music. I composed about half of it and Padma with the other half. So we uh, dug right into learning all the music. It's all done by heart, uh, by memory in Bali. Very, very complex music, orchestral music, but it's, uh, it's all memorized. We also tuned their instruments, which was fun. This was my way of getting to know all the players in the group very well because I. It's nothing like working together to bring you together. Uh, what interests me in particular about this village is that they're, uh, they're great artists, they're great musicians, it's a very famous ensemble, but they're also educators. Many, many of the uh, players in the group are teachers in public schools, private schools, universities, and so forth, and they're farmers too. So they actually kind of put weed together, uh, interesting combination of things. It's out as a kind of a tripartite system. Uh, you have, might have two things that are complementary opposites, and then they interact kind of in the middle, so to speak. Something else happens between or in, through the combination of two things. So, for example, they look at the larger, the macrocosma, as being the heavens where the um, gods reside, so to speak, and then the middle world where we are, humans and animals and plants and so forth, and then the underworld, which is the home of the, well, another set of spirits. Um, and they 
bring that into many things. So for example, a temple is laid out in, in, in its, and it reflects that same structure. The, the most sacred part of the temple, which faces the mountain, the mountains in central Bali, is uh, in, the, in South Bali, it would be in the northeast corner of the temple. And then there'd be the middle courtyards where the work of rituals goes on, where the gamelan group comes and arrives, where people bring their offerings, where you know, various preparations happen. And there would be the outer courtyard, which is where people you know, arrive outside of the temple proper and uh, is considered the least pure, the least sacred part of the temple. And that part is always oriented towards the sea, which is the home of the, uh, let's say, again, the demons is a bad word, but say the other side, <laughs> the other spirits. And all of this relates to uh, the microcosm of Bali, which is the human body. So you have your head, which is considered your most sacred part, I guess you could say. People in Indonesia don't touch each other on the heads normally. It's considered a violation. And you have your body, where kind of a mundane working workings uh, happen, take place. And you have your feet, which are in contact with the ground, or they're, they're most, considered the most impure part. So this all fascinated me. And this is just like the, the one minute version of something very complex. It's kind of like a fractal in Bali. You see this, once you see this pattern, it's there over and over and over again. It's in musical form. It's in artistic visual form. It's in the layout of a home. It's in the, the structure of a small offering made of you know, fruit and incense and holy water and so forth. Those elements are arranged to reflect this tripartite pattern over and over again. So this is what kind of what got me excited. I worked very intensively with Pa Agnawa. Um, I have a video here. He's a professor. He is a professor. How did you know that? I just guess. Yeah. Well, his his UC Berkeley T-shirt that he was wearing, he got when he was in residence with us here. And, uh, I think he actually did teach here, though. Of course, he did teach a course or two. Let's see. So we uh, spent many hours doing this, sitting together. Um, oh, here we go looking through books. Um, he would explain these texts to me. There's a great many uh, esoteric, sacred, religious texts in Bali, and uh, we went over a lot of them. And he would explain to me how it works. You know, they, connect, they connect musical notes with colors, with gods, with directions, with other elements, and uh, create a kind of grand scheme. So I would sit sit there with Bob Nawa with my laptop, <laughs> and uh, he'd explain, and I'd slowly assemble this over many days of interaction. This became our blueprint for the piece. Oops. There it is. Um, and this is something that I would be emailing to Ian and others here in, uh, in uh, the Bay Area. And they were working from their perspective, trying to wrap their brains around it. So our videographer, um, Eric Kojel, loved this because he could immediately see thing, these five elements. This was one of those categorical systems that we used. You know, space, air, water, fire, earth. Anyone can understand these ideas. And for a visual artist, it immediately gives you an inroad. So um, Ian and Eric and other people in the San Francisco-based crew didn't know that much about Bali before this project started. This allowed them to get into it. And working with Pao Nao in Bali, we slowly started to align our musical compositions with these sections. So the Kebiar is the opening composition that I composed. Composition Satu, composition number one, was Pao Nao's piece. And that we line that up with Bayou, or the, the air section. So all of this was developing you know, very nicely. And then an, a wonderful idea came up. One of the musicians noticed that we, I was actually entitling some of the pieces Rua Vineda. Rua Vineda is the Balinese term for dualism. And uh, this gentleman uh, right here on the left, uh, Pat Nuning, the Bugal player, 
came up to me in this very, this very humble and very refined way, and he said, would it be okay if I suggest something? I said, of course. But, you know, he said, well, you know, you're doing a piece, or we're doing a piece with the, it's all about dualism and Rua Bineda. You know, there's a text, there's an ancient text that's called Rua Bineda. What, what, if, what if we were to read it in the show? I said, well, fantastic. That's a great idea. Um, so this then started a whole cascade of go back and forth between us, and then I say us, I mean I was with the musicians in Bali and Ian and others who were here, back and forth by email, and then later when I got back to the Bay Area, going back and forth with these ideas um, of how the of interaction of technology and this idea of reading. You know, one of the reasons I like uh, the idea of using mabasan, that's the, one of the words in Balinese for this type of recitation, is that it's, uh, it's a very beautiful form in itself. It always involves two people. One person reads in an ancient language called Kawi, and the other person translates it into modern high Balinese so that people who are around can understand it. So what it does is it bring it, it, um, it uses various disciplines. One person is chanting or kind of uh, reciting in the sing-songy voice, and you'll hear it momentarily. And it has a combination of languages. It's this old, it's kind of like Latin in the way the Catholic Mass used to be. You know, this ancient, uh, non-understandable language for most of us. And then the other person translates them to modern Balinese. And there's the narratives, the stories involved. Um, so I love the multidisciplinary act, the fact that it mediated between these ancient texts, these static texts, uh, making them alive, reinterpreting them, and making them relevant. This is actually how they function in Balinese society. And I loved it be because this was, I mean, you know, the pieces I conceived of so far was mostly a musical piece with visuals, kind of put it in a, uh, I don't know, a blunt way. But uh, this, I love this kind of opened something new up because uh, we could have different modalities, not just gamma music, but singing, speaking, uh, and using video as a tool of translation. So, yes, very exciting. So, uh, I conferred with the musicians and they said, well, because I, I got right, interested right away with this whole idea of these ancient texts, partly because of the script, it's very beautiful. And uh, they said, well, I, we know someone who uh, is really great at this. He's in the southern part of the village. He's a school teacher himself. He teaches Balinese and Kawi, this ancient language. So let's go there and, uh, you know, and meet him. So I brought along my flip cam and my camera, my still camera, and all my little devices. You know, I had them on me all the time when I was in Bali. And we met this gentleman. And we had him write out this text, Rua Bineda. And that column, that stone column right next to him, I kind of, I got some duct tape that I had in my bag and I taped my, uh, my um, flip cam up there above him. And I documented him writing this text. And I have uh, that video here, let's see if I can do this. So, um, uh, I just had it stationed, as you can see, directly above his paper. And uh, he just started writing this out. He keeps uh, doves, as you can tell. He also, uh, he also does metalworking. He does welding at his day job. So you'll hear some banging in the background. Uh, four lines to this little bit of uh, text. And when he was done, I asked him to recite it in Kawi, in the original old language, which he did. 
Sri Sarwedeng Sarwa Buddha Iking Jatuh Wadidu Nang Gumaweya Kena Ikan Subo Asipo Parmo Gunung Panentasa Kena Ring Subo Parmo and to hear as he does this, he automatically goes into the cadence and phrasing that goes along with his language. It's kind of impossible almost for someone like him to not say it that way. He can't just say it flat. Now he's translating into Indonesian from my So forth. So, here we have this nice video. Now what are we going to do with it, right? Um, so that became the, uh, the challenge. Let's see. Here we are now. Um, this is now on stage. Now we're kind of fast forwarding into the production itself. What are we going to do? Well, my idea was that because this, partly because this text is so beautiful to me, I mean, I just find it visually so appealing, I wanted it to appear really large behind the musicians. And I wanted it to appear as the two readers. There's Pat Nuding, who you saw earlier, the guy who had this idea on, on the right. And on the left is Pat Adi, who is, I think, his first cousin, if I'm not mistaken, the guy who was in the rice fields earlier. Um, so the idea was to have it appear and for it to play while they were reciting it. In other words, play in the sense that you would see that text being written while they're reciting it. So challenges arose in this. It wasn't obvious, or I mean, it was. It, it seemed obvious to think about it, but it, to actually do it wasn't so easy as it turned out. For example, the um, where they what they were doing is in two languages, right? It's in Kawi and it's in High Balinese. Well, in San Francisco, I think the people who speak High Balinese are not many. So obviously we want to have it in English. So that means three languages. So right away we were like, oh my god, how are we going to do this? You know, where, where, how does that third language get into the picture? Synchronization, like the, the writing of that script didn't align with how long we wanted this scene to last on stage. We maybe in, if we had months more time to work on it, we could have made it, made it, make it align, but it wasn't. Uh, wasn't lining up, so we had to we had to figure out a way to match them live in, in the hall. And then finally, we had a challenge of going from this section into the next one, which was the section having to do with water. Those are just a few of the challenges. So uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna go and play it, and then. Uh, I, we can talk a little bit more about how we met some of those challenges, but I'm trying to respect our time. Here. Uh, let's try this again. Hmm. Um, I'm going to have to plug in my own computer. I didn't test this from here. <laughs> Pure, I can I can just pull this out, right, and just plug it into my own. I'm assuming that's going to work. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. Ah, oh, good. from the previous section. As you can see we had three screens that we had to synchronize in the theater.
hear the doves coming in, right? So from that original home of that writer. Here they're very quickly reenacting what would happen in a temple. A temple, they somebody would put out a table, bring an offering. This is how their recitations always happen. One thing I liked about this was that the piece of paper he's holding was that is that same piece of paper that was written on the So among, among other things, one thing that's happening is that I believe I am was riding a little joystick that controlled the tempo of how fast the video was playing of the writing. So now uh, the transition I mentioned, we're going, this is, uh, we want to move into the next section which is based on the element of water. Uh, so those two gentlemen you just saw doing the reading go behind the screen and they enact what you're about to see. It's actually being done live, so it, it, uh, I guess it could have been a, just a video, a recorded video projection, but they're, they're in back of the screens with this bowl of water and flowers, swirling it with their hands. So what you're seeing is both the live video feed of the bowl of water, and then you're also seeing the shadow of their arms reaching down in. Mm -hmm. 